Welcome back to Wood Engineering. I'm Jeff Orochko from Carleton University, and in this video, we're going to talk about defects and deterioration of wood products. This is a nice figure from the Introduction to Wood Design text and from the CWC, and it shows all of the different um, all the different uh, defects that you can have in um, wood members. Um, as well as giving some idea about grain. Now, one of the defects not um, not shown here is um, about grain angle. So um, one of the problems that we can have in a piece of wood is if the grain itself is not lined up with the longitudinal uh, direction, and if it's on a bit of an angle, then that also reduces the strength of our piece of wood. And that is taken into account in the grading process when they decide whether a piece of wood is a high grade piece of wood or it's a lower grade piece of wood. Um, one of the things they have to consider is grain angle. Um, but here you can see different ways that the grain can be arranged on the piece of wood depending on what part of the log it was cut from. But really what I wanna talk about is um, knots and shakes, which are defects that we can have in wood. And um, we're never gonna get a wood timber um, or a lumber specimen that is completely perfect all there there are ways to make the specimens a bit better but um, since wood is a natural product it comes from trees it's biological uh, it's never going to be perfect so there's always going to be some kind of you know knots and defects and it's how many defects and how many knots and what the grain angle is all these things go into determining when you buy a piece of lumber um, what the quality of that piece of lumber is. You know, just like steaks are graded based on quality, so is lumber. So knots, as we discussed when we talked about the structure of what trees look like, knots are basically uh, parts of branches that are within the body of the tree. And, um, you know, you can classify them in different shapes and sizes, how much they are, um, uh, how, how much of them there are, where they are. And um, the thing about knots is they affect strength because uh, they basically represent an interruption in the grain. So wood is very strong parallel to grain. And if that grain is continuous, then that strength continues all the way through. But if we have a knot that interrupts it, then um, we are going to have, you know, by definition, some kind of weakening of that overall piece of wood. And the grain, as you can see in these pictures, when we have a knot, the grain kind of deflects around the knot. But now we have a section here that basically doesn't have strength. So we've kind of reduced effectively the effective cross-sectional area. And there are different kinds of knots. But um, um, one of the key points here is that since it is um, reducing that net area, it's going to reduce the tension strength more than the compression strength. Because when I pull on the piece, that knot is basically a interruption in the grain. But if I were to press on the piece instead, that knot will bear against the wood that's on either side of it. So um, that's why it's worse for tension than compression. And based on whatever grade of wood you have, there's limits to how many knots there are, how many there can be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, other types of defects that you might have in wood include check shakes and splits. These are, um, uh, these are all effectively kind of different kinds of cracks that we can have in the wood, uh, you know, like a, uh, radial longitudinal crack caused by moisture content changes. This is happening because um, the radial and the tangential shrinkage are not the same. So since the tangential shrinkage is greater than the radial shrinkage, um, that can form cracks in the piece of wood, and that's what a check is. Um, shakes are cracks along the tree rings. Um, which, you know, as it says there, is a defect that is inherent in the wood coming from growing. And um, we can also, we can get other kind of splits just from the drying process, or um, we could get wanes from, you know, even just handling of the wood or it being not a perfect, uh, perfect, uh, perfect piece of the tree. Okay, so um, those are not super important for us to consider because um, that's all included in the grading process. So at no point are we as engineers um, um, basically considering that until we get into the case that we have a piece of timber or lumber that has been installed and then cracks after the fact and we would like to check um, what the strength is. Um, and in that case, we have to make some assumptions to consider, you know, is this, how does a split or a check or something affect either the cross-sectional area 
or the effective length of a section or um, um, how the section will buckle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, or you know, what is the shear strength of the specimen. But as far as deterioration and preservation, I mean, wood being a biological product, uh, you know, it's, um, it's subject to biological processes. If we have a, a tree that falls down in the forest, you know, whether someone hears it or not, um, it's going to eventually decay. And so we should understand what the processes of decay. Um, so that we can prevent our lumber that's in structures from decaying. Um, we also want to understand uh, what kind of natural pests uh, can attack wood, because if that happens in trees, it can happen in structures. So the primary um, uh, mechanism for wood decay is by fungus. So when the wood falls on the ground, um, spungal fours, <laughs> fungal spores will eventually um, encounter it and then it will grow basically fungus in the wood. The wood is a food for that fungus and it steadily breaks down the wood until it uh, effectively goes away and becomes part of the soil, the rest of the wood that's there. So in order to prevent that, uh, we wanna be able to keep our wood dry is kind of the number one thing. So um, we wanna keep our wood below about 20% moisture content because below there, we're not gonna be able to encounter any rot. So to do that, we want to keep it inside if possible, or if it's outside, we wanna be able to make sure that if it does get wet, that it dries off. Because um, the way that rot happens is that the wood has to be continuously at a high moisture content. If the wood gets wet for a little while and then dries off, uh, the fungus doesn't have enough time to grow. So um, this picture of avoiding block gutters and keeping the the space is clear for the drainage of the interior wall there are just to make sure that any water that does get in is able to get out. And in walls, uh, in building envelope assemblies, you know, water is always going to get in. Uh, even with a brick veneer like this, you know, there's rain driven, um, there's wind driven rain and stuff like that, that is going to, you know, the masonry is porous. Um, eventually some water will get in and that's okay as long as we provide a way for the water to escape again, which is what those uh, spaces are between the bricks. So in order for the fungi to grow and our wood to rot, they need all of these things, okay? The food is a given because that's the wood itself. It needs moisture, uh, the fungus needs moisture, it needs access to oxygen in the air, and it requires a um, favorable temperature. So if it's too hot or too cold, then the fungus can't grow, then the wood can't rot. So it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like the fire triangle. You know, you need the moisture, you need access to air, and you need favorable temperature. Um, otherwise, um, the wood is safe, basically. So we're trying to keep that the case. Okay. So here's rate of growth of uh, fungi um, on wood dependent on temperature. So you can see if the temperature is basically within a range of zero to thirty-five then the temperature is going to be okay for wood rot. So basically temperature is kind of a non-issue in this sense because it will be very hard for us to keep our wood at a temperature below zero or above 35. So that's not the primary way that we're going to go about um, protecting our wood. Um, the primary way is going to be to keep it dry. So here's some kiln drying so that we can deliver the wood to site at an appropriate moisture content. We don't want to distribute green wood um, here's the kiln. I think this is a pressure uh, treating oven actually. So um, one of the things that we can do instead of going after the air or the moisture is that we can actually poison the food. So that's the process of pressure treatment is basically putting a chemical into the wood and impregnating it into the wood using, um, using the chemical and a pressure vessel in order to basically make the wood unpalatable to the fungus. Also, certain kinds of wood are naturally resistant to decay. I mean, if you're just looking at the difference between heartwood and sapwood in this picture, um, heartwood is more resistant to decay than sapwood, although eventually will decay. Um, in addition to all those other aspects, um, keeping dry being number one, if you can't keep it dry, you know, pressure treatment is, is, a, is a second option. Um, we want to keep um, it away from being attacked by uh, termites and other insects that that uh, and worms and stuff that will attack the wood. So a lot of that will be in detailing and uh, detailing of the envelope, which is not usually our responsibility, but to, uh, to keep the infestation out. 
but there's also i think wood treatments that can um that can prevent termites from um, liking them. Here's another potential pest of wood and what it's done to a living tree called uh, Bankia. Okay, so going back to pressure treatment, um, you know, this is not our first line of defense. Um, usually, you know, pressure treated wood is used for stuff that goes explicitly outside. Um, like if you're building a deck and you have that wood that looks kind of green, that's pressure treated wood. Um, now actually it looks a bit brown because it's a bit more environmentally friendly pressure treatment that they do. But so basically, um, you know, if we want to, um, prevent insects, if we want to increase the fire resistance of the wood, and if we want to prevent fungal rot, um, these are things that we can, uh, use a pressure treatment to impregnate wood with, um, chemicals to prevent those things from happening. And um, there are a number of different chemicals that are used depending on what the application is. But basically when they do this, they cut little slits all along the piece of wood on all sides um, in order to provide an ingress for those chemicals. So we'll see later when we talk about wood strength that uh, when we pressure treat, we tend to lose some strength because of the fact that we needed to modify the surface of the wood and make some cuts and stuff in order to get the chemical to go in properly. So that's all we have about decay and deterioration. And um, um, we will continue with some uh, videos on, uh, on wood strength.